Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Brie Noble. I am so happy to be here today with Madeline Elise from Shark Attack Records. And we're going to talk about data today. We'll talk about some other things too, but I think it's really important to talk about data and how you can use data to make decisions in your career and how you can not let data steer you in the wrong direction, which will be just as much of a conversation as the first part, I think, because, you know, sometimes we get just attached to vanity metrics and things like that. And we don't want those driving our decision making. So we will jump into that in a sec. But first, I would love for Madeline, let our listeners know like a little bit about your backstory, how you got involved in music, what made you decide to start a boutique record label, all the things. Yeah, well, first off, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. My name is Maddie. I started Shark Attack Records in 2016 as kind of a homebrewed record label. And basically what happened at the time was we were working with a bigger manager. I was an independent artist and we were working with a bigger manager. We were trying to get signed, had a contract on the table and decided it was not the direction we wanted to go because basically we were selling all of our friends get dropped and signed and all that fun stuff. So ultimately what we ended up doing is saying it wasn't for us. We got dropped by our manager and I stopped doing music for a while. And one of my really good friends, Eric Calvert, who's a music supervisor was like, Hey, do you want to do this thing for sync? And I was like, no, not really. He's like, well, I get you paid. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Cause you know, struggling musician need, need to make rent. And basically that turned into more and more things. And ultimately what ended up happening is after getting that sync, my friend started coming to me being like, Hey, how did you do this? And then Eric came back to us and was like, Hey, if your numbers were on socials, I can get you paid more and more opportunities for you. So I started really getting into marketing and what data meant and how to build out based on the data you're seeing. And that kind of just spiraled. So it started out with just my friends coming to me, asking me for my help and my friend's friends. And then all of a sudden labels started reaching out. And then right before the pandemic, um, I had a lot of major labels reaching out, asking me how I was doing, what I was doing, how, how they could get involved and stuff like that. So it kind of spiraled into something so much bigger than I could ever have possibly imagined. But it's a beautiful thing. I do what I love for work every day. That is very cool. So what are some yeah. examples of some of the placements that you got just based? On, I mean, obviously you had a connection there. But, you know, you're not going to get those deals if you don't have great music. And like you said, you know, if you grow your numbers a little bit. So number one, like what are some examples of some placements that you got? And then like, what does the growing the socials, how does that get you paid more? I I find that very interesting. Yeah. So basically what happened was we ended up landing League of Legends. We got a couple of Gibson things. I've got, I've been on a couple of ABC shows and it's kind of just spiraled and I'm not really in the sync world anymore. Um, I really took a, a right-hand turn and went down marketing really hard. But basically the bigger an artist is, the more value they have in terms of like being able to demand things. And so when you grow your social numbers and you grow your streaming numbers and your whole package is ultimately better, you have more room to negotiate when you come to the table. Just, I mean, not just with sync, with anything. Um, I find that really interesting that it's true about sync because I feel like with sync, it's more about how the song fits in the show or the movie. For sure. But you can also go the other way if they want a specific sound. I mean, um, I mean, and like I said, I'm not really in the sync world anymore, but I know there was a brief that came out a couple uh, weeks ago 
for a liquor company that wanted a specific, you know, artist and they were looking for exactly that specific artist and they hadn't found that yet. So they're mm-hmm. looking for an artist with X amount of well, Target actually does this quite a bit. Target's actually brilliant at this. They get influencers to be in their commercials. They get all these people to be in their commercials and they choose music that has a foundation because basically it cross pollinates. So it's it's possible. It's it's on the rarer side, but it definitely is possible. Interesting. So what made you decide to go headfirst into marketing and not stay in the sync world? Um, because I love I loved helping people. I mean, I I think I'm like, I'm very motherly. Like my artists are my babies. Um, And I mean that because like every artist that I work with have been with me for years and, you know, they don't go anywhere because this is a marathon and not a sprint. Mm -hmm. It takes years to develop. You don't come screaming out of the can. Like it takes a long time. And it's about learning how to navigate that career that makes it worthwhile. Yeah, it definitely takes a lot of patience Uh, It takes being able to navigate twists and turns and ups and downs and all of that. And I totally get what you're saying. Like I've taken kind of those tests, like brand tests, you know, and I found that I was considered an advocate because I just love to like promote other people. When I see something good, I want everybody to know about it. Oh, hundred percent. And like, I think there's a really negative, toxic trait within music where we all compete against each other. And I really hate that. And I've had a couple of friends like really show me the other side of that. And I think that's kind of what pulled me over to being like, no, they can be doing cool things and I could be doing cool things. And if we're doing them together, even cooler, you know what I mean? Um, And building that community is so important. We shouldn't be you know, cutting people off, we should be pulling them up. Yeah, no, I totally agree. The all boats rise with the tide kind of mentality and And seriously, like, just because I like one artist doesn't mean I can't like another. You know what I mean? It's not like I I only like chocolate ice cream and I like nothing else. No, no, no. Some days I want chocolate. Some days I want strawberry. Absolutely. Awesome. So what made you decide to start a record label? Um, It kind of just happened naturally. Like, uh, it it wasn't necessarily something that I was going for, but I want to be able to support the community just as much as the community supports me. And that's kind of how I felt about it. So when I get to mentor, help bring up another artist, it makes me feel good. It's kind of a selfish thing if you think Mm. about it. It's very true. It makes me feel really good. I just love being on the front lines with them. Um, Something that I say, and it's super cheesy, so I apologize. I don't bleed for my artists. I bleed with my artists. And that's a really big thing because I can't tell you how many times I've been on teams with major label artists or legacy artists where I'm like, no one cares on this project. No one cares. They're all here punching a time card and it makes me sad. And that's not what music is mm. about. That's not what art's about. This is, a we chose to get into this industry. We should love what we do. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if we don't, why are we doing it? Because it's not like exactly. music is like the easy path. Oh, absolutely. And it's not like a pain <laughs> crazy amounts of money. Either. Totally. Well, let, okay. So let's get into analytics because sure. I think this is something that really, it confuses artists. It frustrates them. It, it can maybe get them spinning out in the wrong direction. Um, so let's just, first of all, let's talk about, you know, what data actually matters? Like, you know, what data should we be paying attention to and what data we should just be like, that's just a vanity metric or that doesn't even matter. So vanity metrics or anything like likes, followers, streams. Um, I, I could care less about any of those metrics. What to me matters is engagement. Is it real engagement? Are you actually turning a fan? Would that person actually show up at your show? A big thing you see right now is um, empty streams. And this is why I tell people, it's, and I stole this from a dear friend of mine, but he always tells people, keep your eyes on your own paper. And the reason he's saying that is because you don't know what's behind everything, right? You don't know how much money they put into advertising. You don't know if they bought bots. There's so many things to manipulate these numbers that you don't know. So what I try to teach my artist is don't look at the number, look at the whole picture, right? If you're releasing a song and all of a sudden your numbers go up and then the second the song is released and you stop paying for whatever you're paying for, everything goes down, there's a problem. Because that means you basically, you're going to get some decrease, let me just say that. But you're not going to see that basically, the I call them peaks and valleys. So on your analytics, if you see a massive peak and then a massive valley, there's a problem. That means either you were botting, you basically got on bad editorial. Um, There's a lot of things that could have happened. But what you really want to see is you want to see basically that like slow, I call it a staircase. 
where mm-hmm. it's basically like, yeah, we got one step up here and we came down a little bit, but we're actually going back up. And we came down a little bit, but we're actually going back up. And you want to see that over a long a period of time. You don't want to just see that really quick. You want to see that consistently with every release. You want to see a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And the way you win as an independent artist is playing the algorithms because an independent artist is never going to have as much money as a major label artist is going to have. So ultimately you play for the algorithm. Um, you want to hit that algorithm every time. And while you're hitting it, you want to make sure you're seeing what I like to call spillage. So if you hit Discover Weekly on Spotify, I want to see it going to your Instagram, to your TikTok, to your YouTube, to your Twitter. I want to see where else it jumped because ultimately I want to see that the people that actually it hit are actually invested in who you are. Does that make sense? No, it totally does. But I do think there's, it's a hard, it's like a big, um, a canyon to cross between Spotify and the other places, right? Because there's no easy way to really get people over there to, I guess they do have, you do have your social medias on your Spotify. Like they can click through to that, but like you can't grab an email address or anything. So it's, it's quite a big jump for someone to like hear a song and like it and then go over to the other places. A hundred percent. But that's exactly my point. You want to see that jump. If you're not seeing that jump, are you hitting the right audience? Because I can tell you when artists actually hit the algorithm and hit it successfully, you see that jump. It's not, you're not going to see everyone jump. You're going to see a smaller percentage. You're going to see like maybe 1% if you're lucky, one to 3%, right? But that's what you want to see. And you want to see that consistently because music is passive now. That's just the reality of it. How many people do you know that actually sit down and just sit down to listen to music? Very rare. It's passive. I do when I'm on vacation because I yeah, know I have course, time, right? Course. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, we were in Paris in January and I listened to a new record while I was up there. So every time I listen to that record, I'm going to think of Paris, but it was mm-hmm. like the only time that I've had in months <laughs> to like actually sit down and listen to something new and like really like dive into it. But yeah. I think when I are rare in the sense where we love music, there's not many people that actually like love, love music. It's more passive to most people. Yeah, it's that's hard for me to get because I am such an interactive yeah. person with music. Totally. I mean, being a musician, of course, right? So I, I have a hard time getting that idea of that people are passive, but they're most people are. You're right. Like, yeah, I like that song. Cool. Yeah. Go on to the next one. You know, not like I, I want to keep up people. with this artist. I want to make sure that yeah. I don't like lose track of them. So I'm going to go follow them on Instagram. Yeah. But they're there. Those are those are the super fans and those are what you need to like really bolster your career, right? Everyone talks about your first thousand fans. It's one of my favorite concepts out there. But it's true, your first thousand super fans will make your career. Yeah. That's all you need. That's true. So do you have any ways that you help, let's just say from Spotify, you know, that people, like you said, get on an editorial playlist, there's a spike. And then, you know, you're seeing that spillage, then where do they go from there? Do you have um, methods that you encourage people to use to get people to go from like Instagram to an email list? Yeah. So it starts with a conversation and that's the key point of all this. We want you to engage with your audience. People don't realize how rare it is for you to jump from Spotify to Instagram. And once they've jumped, then they make a comment on your post being like, hey, I found you on Discover Week, my Discover Weekly this week, or I found you on Fresh Finds Pop. I'm really in love with you. Like, I love what you're doing. If you don't take the time as an artist to go and basically water that friendship in the sense where this is a friendship, they're investing in you, you have to invest in them, especially when you're just beginning. And I see artists do this all the time. They don't want to reply to comments. And I'm like, why? These people took the time to say something to you. These people took the time to DM you. You need to respond. And that's where it starts is the responding. You have to respond. You have to build a friendship because these are the people that down the road, when you release your next single, you're hoping they support you. And guess what? If you've built enough of a friendship with them, you can be like, hey, can you can you share my single? Can you support me? Here's my new song. You know, all those things along the way. But I find that most artists stop before they even get to that point because they don't want to respond. And it blows my mind a little bit. Yeah, I think sometimes they feel overwhelmed by responding, but I think sure. sometimes they think, well, I need to maintain this mystique as an artist. Do yeah. you find that that happens sometimes? All the time. 
But okay. the reality is, unless you're the Doja Cats of the world, you need, and even her, she started by responding to everyone. The Ed Sheeran, same thing. The Harry Styles, same thing. You respond to everyone. You build your audience out. These are your fans. These are the people that support you. If you don't have five seconds to say hi back, there's a problem or mm-hmm. thank you. I agree. So you would say that the the metrics they should be tracking are how many comments are you getting on Instagram or whatever, you know, TikTok, yeah. whatever your social media of choice is. And, you know, maybe how many people are asking you questions or how much engagement are you seeing? How many yeah. people are singing your song? How many people are saving your song? How many people are going back and listening to your song? Those are the metrics to me. How many people are shazamming your song? Mm-hmm. Those are the metrics to me that matter. I could care less how many streams you have, how many followers you have. I want to see that you have a core fan base and you can build upon that core fan base. Yeah, that's cool. And and shazamming is so cool, I think, because a lot of times indie artists, they get like placements in random streams. You know, I know one day, so like I run a, a female uh, artist podcast where we play music by female artists. And I was at the hair place getting my hair done. And I heard one of the artists that we play on the show. And I was like, oh my gosh, like they're being played on this, whatever this is that they're playing here, the hairdressers network or whatever, you know? And like, it's cool that you can Shazam when you're in the hair place because you hear a song that you're like, or when you're in the, I've done this before. I've been like sitting in the bank waiting to, you know, get called up or whatever. And I hear a song that I like, and you can just so easily Shazam that and then just go, follow it on Spotify. And then, you know, the next time when that comes up on your playlist, then you're like, Oh, I remembered. I like this song. It's just like this like long progression. Right. And then maybe the next time they would go follow on Instagram. So there's a rule of seven, right? You Mm -hmm. have to see and engage with something seven times before you interact with it. And I'm a big advocate of that. I, I noticed from Shazam, like I'll have a song that I really like and I, I've heard it. So I Shazam and I'm like, oh, I'll come back to it later. But then you forget and then you Shazam it again the next time you hear it. And you're like, oh, I already Shazam this song. <laughs> oh, wait, I've done this like six times. Maybe I should go check this out, <laughs> you know? That's so. funny. So I did want to go back to one thing you said about yeah, uh, getting on a, I think you called it like a bad editorial playlist. Yes. Is that an editorial playlist that maybe just has so much turnover and it's the, not the kind of people that actually, you know, continue to follow artists after listening? So I've got a couple of great examples of this. Um, my favorite is New Music Friday. If you're an independent artist, you have no business being on New Music Friday. <laughs> and not only do you have no business being on it, what happens is your your numbers tank because basically New Music Friday is for, I don't want to say top 40, but let's call them top 40 hip happening artists, people that people already know, right? Right. So it's a very active but passive playlist because you basically go on New Music Friday and go, oh, okay, this new Taylor, here's new Weekend, here's the new, you know, Dua Lipa. And you're, you know, so you're skipping through it. So your skip rate gets high. People aren't actually discovering music on that playlist. What they're doing is they're just checking out and seeing what's happening. The skip rate's super high. And what happens for an independent artist is it gets skipped so many times that it just tanks your algorithm. Uh, and so you have no chance of hitting that algorithm. Discover weekly release radar, radio. It's not that you have no chance, but your chance is greatly diminished because of it, because it's such a high traffic playlist. And if you get good positioning or decent positioning, you get skipped like crazy. And then all of a sudden the song tanks. Mm. Um, because as an independent artist, your best route is getting those algorithmic playlists. But what also happens is sometimes like, um, I work with a prog metal guy and he gets rock this all the time. You would think rock this is a great playlist for him, but it's not because it's pop, pop rock right now, even though they're calling it rock, it's pop rock. And he's a prog guy. So he has no business being on that. So the same concept happens where he gets skips a bunch of tanks, his algorithm, and then he doesn't move. So although he got that initial first boost of streams, it's never going to move past that. It's the same with New Music Friday. I'm seeing it happen more often than not, which is really frustrating from my perspective, but everyone's gunning for playlists. And it's like, not every playlist A is the same or B is good for you. Another perfect example of that is the workout playlist. The workout playlists are very passive playlists because what do you do? You put on a workout playlist, you put it in your pocket. There you go. So you might get the streams, but your save rates, your save rate goes down quite a bit. So once again, you're hurting your chances of getting on that algorithm. And so you are chosen for editorial. You can't 
really say no, right? So what do you do? Do you recommend that some people just don't go out for editorial? So that's a great question. It's something that we're still trying to figure out from our perspective. I know for my prog artist, I'm probably not going to pitch him for editorial this time around. Mm. Uh, Just because it tanked, we tried it. He landed six out of six every single time and it tanked it every single time. That's terrible. It sucks. And like, you know, as an independent artist, all I have is those algorithmic playlists to keep moving, moving the needle for him. And so you literally just sit there and you go, oh, what do I do? You know, so we're, we're playing with ideas. Um, I might be more specific with with our distributor being like, hey, I don't want these playlists. I want these. If we can't get these, I'd rather not go for editorial. Mm-hmm. But it's 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 definitely a conversation and areas to play within. Interesting. What about like personally curated niche kind of playlists? Where you go out to the individual. I like niche. Um, I would be very careful with reaching out for playlists for yourself because Spotify is bot infested. And if you end up on, once again, if you end up on the wrong playlist, and sometimes I see it happen where um, a hip hop artist will end up on a country playlist and, you know, you can't really get off of it once you're on it. There are ways, um, but it's really hard. So it's the same concept. So I tell people, play the algorithm, try to get the algorithm to move for you. And don't worry about playlisting. Get the real people to listen to your music. Get actual fans to listen. To me, algorithmic playlists, that's hard to say, are the most powerful. And they're the ones that I, as a listener, use anyway. I don't like listen to editorial playlists. Yeah. And neither do I. I listen to my Discover Weekly and my Release Radar. Yep. You know? Yep, absolutely. What about controlling um like is there any way to control i forget what that's called again where it's like the similar artists that show your up fans, your fans yeah, also fans like. also like that's what it's called you can't control it but we do have ways to like trick it funny enough mm. so basically what you can do is you can create a playlist and surround yourself with artists that you want to be associated with Mm. And you continue to promote that playlist versus the single. So it's, there's ways to trick it and there's ways to basically help associate yourself with it. Um, but that's more of a long, long-term long strategy versus the short-term strategy. Right. That makes sense. So do you see like in artists either that you work with or just other people that you see around kind of a, a disconnect where like maybe they have a million followers on Instagram, but they can't get anyone to come out to a show or they have zero streams or they have a million streams, but like no social following or they can't get anyone to come out to a show. Yeah, I see all directions. I see people that have no streams and can pull, you know, 300 people to a show. And then I see people that have a million plus monthlies that can't pull 150 people to the show. It's, it's wild. But what I, what I patent that to is A, for the people that have 300 people coming out to the shows, are those 300 fans or those 300 friends? Mm. You know, because there is a very big difference between actual fans coming to show and your friends coming to show. I love that friends come support. That's awesome. That's great. You should continue to do that. Um, But I want to see fans in the audience. I want to see people bobbing their head to your music. I want to see people selling your merch. I want to see people wearing your merch. I want to see people engaged with you as a musician. Um, If I see that and see zero socials and stuff like that, that's something you can work with. When you go the opposite, it's a lot harder because basically you've created this whole online presence. A, if it's real. I have many artists that have million plus followers that, you know, have a hard time pulling 50 people to a show. And their stuff's legit, but they built their presence online. So when we do something online, that's when they sell out. That's when we sell a couple thousand tickets. And you're like, yep, here it is. Like, that's where it is. Versus, and it's because you're looking at it from a world perspective, right? So although you have millions of monthly listeners, maybe your audience isn't in California. Maybe your audience isn't in Arizona. Maybe they're in Texas. Maybe they're in Utah. Maybe they're in London. You know, you never know until you look at those analytics and see where they're at. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, that did. Um, What about the other direction? Because I feel like like a lot of the artists that I work with are a little bit older. They haven't really established much of an online presence, either with streaming or social. Like they're just really starting out. But they can bring people out to shows because they've been performing, you know, in a certain region for so long. How can people that do that, you know, that can bring people to a show that have fans and hopefully they're getting them on an email list from there. I know for me, it was front of mind always when I was performing out that I got as many people on my email list as possible. But then what's the best way to translate those people into helping you out algorithmically with Spotify and and socials? 
So uh, first I would question, are you growing your numbers on socials to grow your numbers on socials or you're growing your numbers on socials um, because you just, or because you think it's going to help? Because if you're pulling people to your shows and you're an older artist, what's the goal? Are you trying to make it to that next level? Or are you just trying to play locally and to can you continue to support your craft? Because if you're just trying to create, uh, if you're not really trying to grow, I would say, don't worry about it. Mm. I would say, cause you're not going to get your money is at your show and it's not streaming. Right. Like, so I would, I would question that first. And is, is there a reason for you to grow online and do all that stuff? Cause it takes a lot of money and a lot of energy to grow online. Yeah. I think sometimes they're thinking, well, I'm not going to be able to perform live forever, you know, that kind of thing, or, you know, I don't want to tour anymore or whatever. And then sometimes I think they're just like, it's not not like an ego thing in a bad way, but just like, yeah, I feel totally unlegit because I have five stream, you know, I have five uh, monthly followers on Spotify. I mean, there was a statistic that came out last year that something like 80% of Spotify is less than 500 monthlies. And so if you get over that hump, you're in the top 20%. Wow. Um, Yeah, it's pretty crazy, right? And people actually need to actually think about that because that's wild to think about. If you like really wrap your brain around it, um, because 500 monthlies is nothing. Uh, uh, Digitally speaking, it's nothing. You should be able to do that naturally. But that aside, I tell artists, Every, every artist is different. If it works online for you to develop and grow, great. Let's focus on that. If it doesn't, because you're an old, I mean, I worked at Bob Skaggs record, right? They wanted to do this whole promo thing where you went to Best Buy and you took a picture of yourself with the album in front of Best Buy and you uploaded it. All of his followers were in their fifties and sixties. And they're like, we don't know how to do this, but we love the record. Thanks so much. And they would comment that because that's all they could do. That's totally fine. You know, I'm working with Morris Day right now. He's never going to have, he's an incredible artist, legendary artist, right? Incredible. Absolutely love him. He sells out a show like it's nothing and plays this great performance and it's a thing and it's incredible and it's so much fun. I mean, I think he's got 100,000 monthlies. And for a legacy artist that toured with Prince for basically the majority of his career, like you would think it would be bigger, right? But it's not because his demographic isn't on Spotify. His demographic, they're all over his Instagram and his Facebook, but they don't really get Spotify. So they're not really there. And that's totally fine. And you also know? for him, I think the real magic is probably live. Like, oh, his, yeah. Oh, know, totally. His recordings are good, but the real magic, I'm sure, is live. It's incredible. I mean, talk about someone that can bring down a house. Yeah. Seeing him perform was one of the coolest things ever. Uh, but wow. that's exactly my point. Like, we're never going to be able to, unless we're going for a younger demographic, which we can do. Like you have to go for the tweens. You've got to go for the tweens to the 27th. That's your demographic if you want online, you know? Yep. So I would question, I, I always questioned artists about this. What's the purpose? Are you just growing it to, to play to your ego? Ego being a very kind term, not trying to like disrespect anyone, but like, or are you doing it because you want to grow? Is the point, um, when I work with legacy artists, the question is, are we trying to hit the demographic we already have, or are we trying to build a new demographic? Because mm-hmm. if we're trying to build a new demographic, that makes sense. Then we have to figure out how to build around that younger demographic. How do we hit the urban outfitter kids? How do we get to that demographic, the younger kids that buy versus the older? Right. And so what if... What if an artist is looking to like up level their career and they're thinking, I need to have a certain metrics in order to attract a a label deal, a manager, a booking agent, any of those things. Do you think that's still the case that these days that you need to have a certain metrics and like what what are those levels? You definitely have to have certain metrics. And depending on what the goal is, the metrics are going to be different. Um, I'm not a fan of major labels. Major labels are for major artists. If you're an independent artist and you're growing, I would say stay away from a major because you don't want to be stuck at the bottom of that totem pole. You want to have that leverage to fight so they actually pay attention to you. Getting a record deal isn't hard. Mm -hmm. Keeping your record deal is hard. In my opinion, I shouldn't say it's not hard. That was bad. I, I, I mean that in a very like genuine kind way. It's hard, but it's not as hard as people think. Once you set the foundation, but staying on top and staying present and staying involved and keep moving, you do not want to be at the bottom of that totem pole because you'll get washed behind and they won't care. As far as managers go, um, I, I, I've been, you've got to find the right manager that works for you. 
there's all, I work with all sorts of managers, shapes, sizes, all different across the gamut. There are great developing managers. There's great major label managers that work. You know, when, when we were working with a manager, he was amazing and wonderful, but he didn't know what to do with an independent indie band. He only knew what to do once you got signed and did all that stuff, but that didn't help us. You know what I mean? Yep. So you've got to find the right manager. As far as a booking agent, you got to, you got to clock those numbers because a booking agent is only going to make money if you're selling tickets. So until it makes sense for you to get a booking agent, do it on your own. Same with management until it makes sense for you to have a manager, do it on your own. You've got this. Anyone can do all of this stuff. Yeah. I mean, they can like that is, yeah. that has been my call to arms from the beginning, but man, I get so many, I get so many comments like on my Facebook ads when I'm, you know, promoting a resource or something. And the comments are like, we're musicians, not business people. And I'm just like, yeah. yeah. And you know what? I t- <laughs> Totally. What and I, and I hear them, but here's the reality. You, you learned your is- instrument by studying and practicing and building into it. This is no different than learning an instrument. This is just business. Learn the business, get really good at it because all it's going to do is help you in the long run. Yes, I totally And agree. if you can learn an instrument, especially like piano, Like you can learn anything or violin. I I agree. So let's talk about, you know, when you're looking at your data, like what do you find is the best way to track your data and how can you really utilize that data to like turn those numbers into real fans? Yeah. So what I do to track my data is I literally have signed up for every website, Spotify for artists, Apple Music for artists. Um, and I look and see where people are converting, right? So I'm looking for not just streams, but I'm looking for basically for you to save, like, share, and Shazam, engage with that single. So basically, when I see that happening, we look and we go, okay, does it fall within a, a healthy range? Or does it fall beyond a healthy range or below a healthy range? So on Spotify, the thing you look at is you look between a 5 and a 10% save rate. If the save rate is between 5 and 10%, you're in good standings. If it's above 10%, you're in really good standing. If it's below 5%, something's wrong. Mm. So if they're if they're in that standing, I always say that's good standings. You have choices when you're in that between that 5 and 10%. You can put more money into ads. You can do more social media. And if you're really into like that 15 to 20%, and sometimes I see, I've see i seen as high as 50% save rate, which is pretty wild. That's like unheard of, especially when you get to like the millions of streams. Like a, the higher number you get, the lower the save rate typically is. But sometimes you get a track that has a million plus streams and they'll have like a 40 or 50% save rate. And you're like, damn, that's crazy. This song really is taking. What can we do now to help support this song? So I would say a song will raise its hand And when it does, that's when you have to like really pour on the gasoline and be like, okay, should we do a music video? Should we do a PR campaign? Should we do an overhead music campaign? What other things can we do to promote this? Because obviously this song has legs. Mm -hmm. So that's what we focus on. And then we really push hard until it doesn't have legs anymore. A great example of this from a mainstream perspective is Julia Michaels' Issues. She sat on that song for years Mm. and they did remix after remix after tour after all these things. And they just kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it because the song had legs. If the song didn't have legs, that's when you move. And it's okay. Not every song is going to work. I would actually say the majority of songs don't work. But as long as you land between that 5 and 10% save rate and you keep pushing forward, you're going to be fine. And should like, is it good practice to email your list of fans and encourage them to pre-save or, you know, to at least save the song when it comes out. Does that help kind of spark the algorithm? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm not a big advocate of pre-saves. Personally, I think people are, well, first of all, it wasn't a Spotify thing until recently. So it was actually a third party thing that basically said, hey, pre-save the song and we'll give this data to Spotify. So I'm not a big advocate of pre-saves. They did just change that where now pre-saves is a Spotify thing. But the problem with that to even like get noticed, you need thousands mm. of pre-saves, tens of thousands of pre-saves. Like I've had artists get like three, 4,000 pre-saves. And for an independent, that's incredible. Like yes. most independents, like 300 is really good. Yep. But when you get to the thousand point, that's like, whoa. But guess what? That's not enough for Spotify to like really do anything. When you get to the tens of thousands, that's when they're like, oh, okay, this is interesting. Let's do something with this. But so I say, don't worry about the pre-save when it comes out. Just tell your fans to like, share, and to like and share it basically. Um, because that's what will help kick the algorithm into gear. Yeah, I feel like it's it was such a big 
thing, pre-saves for, for a long time. It was. And there wasn't really any data behind it to say that it did anything. So there was an interesting case study a while ago with Justin Bieber, where basically he had, you know, he probably hundreds of thousands of pre-saves for his record. And what they found was that everyone that pre-saved his records only listened to the hits. They never got to the second half of the album. Mm. So basically the second half of the album was really never listened to. So basically it was showing that pre-saves didn't mean anything because they still just went after the hits. When was the last time you pre-saved a song and went and listened to it right when it came out or an album? Because I, I can't even tell you one time I've pre-saved a song, maybe Beyonce, but like... <laughs> I mean, it sad. does send you... Often it will send you an email and it remind yeah. you that it's there. And then sometimes I would then listen to it that day. Yeah, I think only once in my <laughs> it's the entire time I've had Spotify and it was literally just for Beyonce. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes you feel like you're just like, you hear all this advice and you just don't know what the truth is behind it. And so that's really interesting about that case study. Uh, I did want to ask about ads since you did mention ads a couple of times. What do you recommend for your artists as far as ads? Do you recommend Facebook and Instagram ads? Are you trying to drive them to listen on Spotify with those ads or sign up for email lists? And what is your opinion about Spotify ads? Um, the marquee ads are great um, if you qualify for them. I'm a big advocate of them. The in-studio ads are kind of hit and miss. And the marquee ads work even better when you have a known artist because it's name recognition. So I am a big advocate of them when they make sense. As far as ads for independent artists, Spotify and Instagram are a great place to start. The meta ads are great. You can also look into Snapchat. You can also look into TikTok. I mean, you can basically advertise everywhere. Depending on what the goal is, depends on what you want to do with it. You always want to run a conversion ad. You always want to track what you're doing. You never want to just really run a traffic ad. There are exceptions to that rule, but I would say like 80% of the time you really want to run a conversion ad um, because it's going to get rid of a lot of that bot traffic. And it's also going to collect data for you. And therefore you'll be able to retarget further down the line. And that's the key. Um, but to me, advertising is a black hole. It makes a lot of sense to advertise when it's smart, uh, when there's a reason to, but it makes no sense to advertise when there's not a reason to. So what I typically tell artists to do is let's get the algorithms moving naturally, and then we'll throw on the gasoline, the advertising when it makes sense. Um, because if you're not going to spend consistent money consistently, it just, you're basically, you're targeting and not able to retarget it. So it doesn't really make sense for you to do it. Um, it's all about the return. It's not necessarily all about the first ad. It's about the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth ad. Yeah, I think a lot of times artists think that ads are a solution. Yeah, uh, it's when not. When they're really not. Yes. <laughs> yes, I get in this conversation all the time. Digital, digital marketing means I'm going to get you in front of the right people. But it's your job once I get you in front of those people to A, bring them in and B, turn them into a fan. Like that's the goal. Obviously there can be other goals, but for most artists, that's the goal. Yeah. And you should be able to convert organically first. You should naturally have that algorithm first. Right. If you don't, there's a problem. Something's wrong with the content and you have to start there because it doesn't matter. I've worked crazy campaigns where we've had like half a million dollars to run in ads and like, and it's fun and you learn a lot. And it was a lot of fun working that project. But the reality is, no amount of money is going to change bad content. Like mm. you can't pay your way to the top. It's just not how this works. You turn a fan of one person at a time. And that is the whole point of all of this. What do you think about, because I always felt Spotify ads, were not targeting the right people in that anyone that's not paying for Spotify is probably not a hardcore music fan. I actually like the, the marquee ads. Uh, mm. I think they work really well. But once again, it's that name recognition. They work really well when you have name recognition. Yeah. Um, it, like if you, we had a feature track with Jeremiah. We spent a ton on the marquee ads um, because Jeremiah is a known artist. Hmm. Um, so, but they do work. They do work and they are effective. And if you think about it from another perspective, a Spotify marquee ad costs 51 cents and it goes to a primary user on Spotify versus a Facebook ad that can run 25 to, I mean, I've seen, I've seen it go quite a bit higher than that. But we're talking U.S., so 51 cents per stream in the U.S. for a guaranteed stream. That's not bad conversion. You can get it cheaper, but then you're also risking it. Because when you're when you're advertising off-platform, you don't know that it's just Spotify. These are just people that, in theory, are interested in Spotify. Does that make That's sense? True. Yeah, yeah. No, that does make sense. You know, it's just a whole 
it's adding another platform into the stack. Yep. Yeah. A lot of platforms. <laughs> yes. I know. I know. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to let let our listeners and watchers know about data and how you use it to help your artists? I would just help artists, developing artists, or even established artists, keep your eyes on your own paper. Realize that this stuff takes time. Look at your data and read your data and let that inform your decisions that you're making. If something's not working, it's okay. Let it go. You can always come back to it later because maybe it's a timing thing, but sometimes it just means it wasn't the best piece of content for the time right then and there. doesn't mean it can't work in a couple of years or six months. Let the data inform your decisions. That's true. Do you do you have like one centralized like dashboard that you used for data or do you just logging into all the different locations all the time? I log into all the different locations because I think, and this could be me totally being uh, a little weird, but I think it's important to log in and see what they're showing you versus what a third party is ripping because they give you a lot of clues in your data and in their platforms that tell you how to inform things that necessarily third parties won't tell you. And they're free. <laughs> like, so you don't have and to pay free, yeah. for yeah, you know, some third party thing. So yeah. Absolutely. Sure. Well, this has been really informative and helpful and just even like helped me solidify my thoughts about certain data and platforms and things like that. So thank you so much for that. Where can our listeners find you online? Uh, you can go to our website. This is sharkattack.com and everything's there. You can definitely look us up from there. Cool. What about social? Um, all of them are, this is Shark Attack. Got it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Maddie. This has been great. I appreciate you and all the knowledge that you brought to our listeners today. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.